Hello, thank you for listening. I'm Jean-François Charles. I'm presenting on behalf of the team that we formed with composers Gil Dory and Joseph Norman. This project started a long time ago when I was studying electronic music with Hans Tuchku in France. One day, he demonstrated for the class a neural network object it would potentially operate live classification of different vocalic sounds. At the time, this object didn't include the training algorithm, so we couldn't really use it, but it opened a great discussion among the students. Just imagine the possibilities. When a singer sings with different timbres, we would automatically route the sound to different effects. For instance, we would apply distortion to spoken voice and a long reverberation to sung vowels. And maybe when the singer whispers, we would trigger a specific sequence of sound files. That was the impulse that led us to create the Sonic Print tool and to evaluate its use in new musical compositions. In the field of machine learning applied to music performance, a significant body of work has been published with the goal of mapping either physical gesture or audio features to sound processing. Examples include the Eminem Toolbox, the Wakinator application, the Timber ID Pure Data Object, or the SEC Toolbox. Artists have used these tools to create new music and interactive art. While these tools are highly customizable and flexible, they present a steep learning curve to musicians with no knowledge of machine learning concepts and algorithm. Our goal with Sonic Print is to provide a tool seamlessly integrated in an artist's work environment, offering not only a fast live analysis, but also live learning. Before we show an example, let's clarify how we use the term timbre. We apply the word timbre to classes going beyond the case of musical instruments. For instance, we may contrast the timbre of a flute playing in the normal mode versus flute or tone, or the timbre of different consonants like s, sh, or th. Now, let's have a look at sonic print in action as a Max for Live device. In this second example, the sound is routed to four different tracks depending on the live classification. Now that we have a better feel for this tool, let's have a look behind the scenes. We are working in a context of supervised learning. Many options are available when it comes to the choice of audio features and learning algorithm. Let's start with the audio features. A common set of features are the MEL frequency capsule coefficients, MFCC. They've been widely used for speech processing because they are specially pertinent to separate source and filter when a source filter model applies. Here, 
we cannot assume that a source filter on Mata would apply to our input, input sounds. So we decided to use directly the instantaneous spectral repetition of energy, rather than using the melody-oriented Mel scale. We use the more general Bark scale. For the learning algorithm, we could use a uh, general k nearest neighbors, but we are interested in neural networks for the speed they can achieve in live classification. And when it comes to neural networks, we first need to wonder if a linear model could apply. It is an important step, and to illustrate that, let's have a look at the sonar signals benchmark. This da data set comes from the spectral analysis of sonar responses in presence of either metal cylinders or cylindrically shaped rocks. It's been widely used to test learning algorithms, and although it's been used since 1988, it was only shown in 1998 that the full set of 208 points was linearly separable. It is indeed a well-known result that, with a limited number of training points, the probability that data points be linearly separable is not negligible, and in it increases when the input data are correlated. That is exactly the situation we are in. A musician will assign a single output, a sound class, to a set of correlated input vectors, the bulk values representing correlated timbres. That's, that's the reason why we are going to use a single layer perceptron, which is sufficient to model linear processes. Now, it's not guaranteed that our sets will be linearly separable, so instead of using a typical classification perceptron, which might not converge, we dispense with any sigmoid activation function. Our perceptron will be reduced to a multivariate linear interpolation algorithm. So this is the engine behind sonic print. Beyond guaranteed convergence, another important advantage of the linear regression is the very fast training algorithm. Moreover, we can easily compute the mean squared error from the error matrix in order to display a learning quality indicator to the user. The implementation in Max is simple. We use the built-in linear algebra functions. On this Max version of Sonic Print, you can see the two-dimensional output Y estimate shown on a four quadrant square. The position in one of the quadrants determines the classification. On the Max for Live version, we show the recorded waveforms for convenience, but as we have seen, the processing is made on spectral data. At the bottom here, you can see on the left the bulk reduced spectrum of the live input, and to the right of this indicator are four bulk reduced spectrograms corresponding to the four sound classes. Once concatenated, they constitute the complete learning set. Sonic Print was made available to several artists over the last couple of years. We are presenting here two resulting works. Joseph Norman's Fracture Morphosis and Gildory's Siete Dolores. Fracture Morphosis is a composition for trombone, violin, and double bass with live electronics. Each musician performs with their instrument and a laptop processing their own sound. The output of the processing lines for each instrument is routed to a shared specialization system. In Fracture Morphosis, each instrumentalist is provided with four distinct initial musical gestures. The learning step of Sonic Print is built into the piece as an introduction during which each instrument's gesture is performed without audio processing. You see here the double bass initial gestures. 
Sonic Print acts as a gate to route the musician's sound to one of four processing lines, depending on the resemblance of the live timbre to one of the four learned classes. The composer designed the live audio processes to give, to give each of the four individual sounds a unique processed identity. After the introduction, the musical gestures are altered over the course of the piece so that the distinctions between them become more and more ambiguous. The sonic identity of the pairing between musical gesture and specific effect gradually dissolves. Although the performers received no training in machine learning concepts, they could use the system very quickly in rehearsal. For more about the piece, I invite you to listen to the recording. Siete Dolores results from the close collaboration between composer Gil Dory and saxophonist Jonathan Chazan. Together, they explore elements of a musical composition through the prism of timbre with the prospective goal of developing a method for composers to indicate specific timbres and for performers to interpret them precisely. Shazan, an experienced performer of both early and contemporary music, observed that different musical styles embed in their performance practice different sound production modes, each resulting in a slightly different timbre. Dory explores in Siete Dolores the transition between seven such states. He separates timbre production from other elements of sound to reconstruct it in unexpected ways. Throughout the piece, motives morph through changes in timbral quality and slowly reveal more of themselves. On these score excerpts, we see an initial motive morphing over time. The circle digits indicate which sound production state, which timbre, the performer should use. The work uses sonic print to identify saxophone timbres and map them to LED lights inserted into a second saxophone placed on stage. The LED colors provide visual signals that aim to support guiding the audience through the timbral experience. We note that since there are seven timbres to identify, the composer combined two sonic print units. To route the sound to the first or second unit, Dory used another level of spectral analysis. Although he could adjust all parameters while working offline, the results were not accurate enough for subtle timbre changes in a live situation, so he used fixed cues in some parts. I invite you to listen to the excerpts from a version of Siete Dolores with the included link. The limitations of this tool include the choice of four classes. Many spectral details are lost because we use just 24 filters. The output is undefined when the analyzed sound is far from any training example. The training set has no memory. We would need to modify the tool to make the history of learned examples contribute to the learning. Finally, the quiet parts in the training samples are not filtered out. The user has to make sure they don't include silence in different training examples which would result in a more difficult discrimination. In conclusion, Sonic Print successfully allowed several composers and performers to use automatic timbre recognition and live learning in new musical creations. The tool is seamlessly integrated in environments widely used by creative musicians, Max and Max for Live. Finally, the use of a linear model applied to spectral data enables both a streamlined interface and a short, finite learning time. Thank you.